truth is, I I'm, I don't even want to make a pun at the beginning of this video because I just take a moment to just realize that someone who is blind and low vision can experience a video game. Not all, and we'll talk about that, but there are games that exist that are able to be played by someone who isn't playing with sight. And that just, how cool is that to think about? That someone without visuals can play a visual medium. And I don't, I just, ah, it's, it's really cool. Let's talk about how that happens and how we can do better, right? Video games are a medium that are near and dear to my heart. They've always been a part of me. In fact, Pokemon is my earliest memory, and it's the first game that got me into gaming. In fact, there was a time when I was about 13 to 14 years old where I kind of put filmmaking a little bit to the side, and, and I actually got much more into game development and game design. And there was a point in my life where I thought I might pursue uh, storytelling through video games. And I actually completely haven't written that out yet, but I have obviously have very much embraced filmmaking as the medium that in video as the medium that I love to storytell and share um, my experiences through. But again, who knows, off into the future, I might be looking at a career in video game development uh, from a creative director kind of point of view. And, you know, at the same time, I'm actually kind of already dipping into that industry. I, I do accessibility consulting, so people actually pay me to come in and look at their product, look at their website, their technology, their UI, whatever it is. I experience things on the spectrum of blindness, and I can help people make their products more inclusive. Because of the accessibility consulting, I've actually sort of dipped into the video game industry, and as mainly a consultant and playtester. So we're going to talk about all this. We're going to talk about the current state of gaming for those who are blind and low vision as well as what we hope that developers keep in mind going into this next generation. In fact, I'm actually gonna to talk to one of the inclusive leads at Microsoft and Xbox. Like I mentioned before, I want this video to be collaborative. I want to hear other voices and I want you to hear other voices that aren't just my own because that's a little narrow and I'm not about that. Not to go too far off topic, but do keep in mind going into this video that blindness is a spectrum. And that's why I've included multiple voices because there are people who are right at the legally blind mark in this video and those who are totally blind. As I said before, Pokemon was my first exposure to gaming. I was two years old and I got into Pokemon Blue, eventually Pokemon Yellow, and I've been with the series ever since. The thing about that game was that it was a move at your own pace sort of game. You could take your time with it. It was turn-based. Even though you're in a battle and there's action happening, you still make the moves on your time. Growing up in the generations of 3D modeled gaming, you start noticing that there's a sense of realism with a lot of the newer titles coming out. Development studios are trying more and more to get to a point where they're almost photorealistic. Games are moving at much higher frame rates and action is moving at a much faster and real time pace. One of the game franchises that I have a very fond memory with is actually Halo. And it's because I first experienced it totally blind. I had just wrapped up an ocular surgery on my eyes and I actually had to be completely blinded for about a month while my eyes recovered. Obviously when I was 12 years old and I was staying home from school, my parents are at work, siblings are at school, I needed something to do and pass the time. So I went on my brother's Xbox oftentimes, I would go on Xbox Live and I'd play some Halo. Why? It was a social interaction, I could talk to people, other people around the world, and you know, you get all kinds of characters when you are going in a real game chat room. But at the same time, I met some really cool people, and even people who like I told them, I'm like, hey guys, I'm playing totally blind, I just got this eye surgery, I'm only here really for, for the fun, and I'm not doing like rank matches, more casual, so most people are pretty laid back in these kinds of games, but there was actual folks who were guiding me in the process. They were literally helping me to know where to go. They were telling me if I'm going too far or almost off a cliff, or they put me in a vehicle with them in like a um, passenger seat and take me for a ride. And, and they tell me where to shoot if I'm aiming too high or, or low. It was really cool. So accessibility in video games has actually existed for a very long time. I mean, look back at the very first games that were coming out in the 80s and 90s and there were things like cheat codes where you had things like invincibility or you could maybe skip parts that maybe weren't accessible to you. Game developers have found ways to try and broaden the appeal of some games that may be of different difficulties or require different dexterity abilities as well. And when you look at games that have tried to go into more realistic art styles, you see a lot of colorblind modes oftentimes. And now really this is the bare minimum, especially today, 
but it was really cool, I think, at the time that people like that were being accommodated. And as things have sort of evolved and things like mobile operating systems and computers have all sort of adopted real accessibility features and to the point where blind people can edit video and music production and, you know, control their computer with just audio feedback and surf the web. I think it's time for video games to be kind of included with that. And some have taken initiative to do so, but not enough today. You see, the technology is pretty much all here today. It's just a matter that people need to become aware of the guidelines and best technical practices of accessibility for consistency, and also including a lot of these features and accommodating a lot of different people during the design process. So there's a lot less heavy work to do later on. One of the things that has kind of existed for games for a while, but I've been more recently seeing discussions about it lately is things like assist modes. Things that allow for gamers to still get through maybe a more difficult level for them, but with invincibility, essentially modern day cheat codes in a way, but more accessible to actually turn on. Nintendo is one of these companies that actually has incorporated an assist mode, especially in recent years. In fact, Super Mario Odyssey for the Nintendo Switch was the very first Super Mario 3D game that I've been able to complete and actually really enjoy. I've always tried Mario Galaxy and Mario Sunshine in the past, but there was just parts of it that the 3D worlds just can't always accommodate someone like me. By turning on the assist mode in Super Mario Odyssey, I always had a guide on where to go. It also did help with like if I died too many times or I could take a little bit more damage, but that aside, really what I used it for was always having a visual reference of where I needed to go, because that was super helpful for me. Otherwise, much like any other blind person without a guide, whether it's a cane, a person, or a dog, you're gonna get lost. So I've actually come across a lot of discussions and dialogues online and a lot of pushback from a small corner of the gaming community that just doesn't want assist modes in their games. They don't want to be associated with having to beating a game that offered in assist mode and I just I think that's all a bunch of uh, nonsense in the nicest way possible keep myself at a standard it's weird there's a lot of just like insecurity about playing a game with options and offers a wider appeal for people with disabilities and for uh, gamers who just don't have as much experience and still want to play and experience this game I just I, I find the whole pushback bizarre. Think about it this way. You know, the whole idea of a game is to get from point A to point B and go through an experience. Well, much in real life, as a blind person, I oftentimes have to go from point A to point B, and I do like to enjoy the ride. For me, I can't drive. Legally, but I also, I just shouldn't drive. I can't drive, really, like the way that you're supposed to drive. So what do I do? Well, I call an Uber, I call a Lyft, I get a friend who can drive to drive me. Kind of like an assist mode, right? For driving. Why can't, why can't games offer that? What's wrong with having our entertainment be accessible? It's, it's, I don't know. I like to think about it that way or if a game is like a car. Oh, because you can drive and you have a license, suddenly blind people can't get into a car at all? At all? Really? I know they're completely two different things, but I do like to think there's some parallel there in that, that analogy. I just, at the end of the day, I think it's nonsense to not be okay with accessibility in games. Just because you don't use it today, you could need it tomorrow. A lot of the time, people with disabilities don't always have that disability at birth. I'm one who did, but when it's one in seven people in the world, one in five in America, you just never know when you're going to want to go back and enjoy a game you have to interact with the world a little bit differently because of some sort of disease, accident, or life event. Who knows what can happen? Again, not to get too far off topic, but assist modes or just accessibility in video games in general. If you have pushback towards it, you're only setting yourself up for failure down the road. So it's great when a video game itself is accessible, but what about the game console? The, the thing that's playing that, the hardware and the operating system behind booting that game up. What if that's inaccessible? I talked to a fellow Legally Blind gamer and YouTuber about that very thing, Steve Saylor. If you have actually seen my past videos, you may have encountered Steve. He is a gamer who talks about the accessibility in games on his YouTube channel and has wonderful value to contribute to that industry. So here's how that dialogue went. Disability will affect the majority of us later on in life. Yep, um, and I think it's actually ablegamers.org has, has come out and said specifically for America that there's 33 million disabled gamers uh, in the country. And that's a huge uh, audience. I mean, look at services like Apple Arcade for a moment. Like 
that yeah. is a it's a fully on well no it's not fully on your phone but you know most people i think would be playing it on their phone or tablet ipad i should really say in this case because it's exclusive to ios and mac os sure. and tv os so it's apple's kind of um here's over 100 titles they're all available to download and use offline. And as long as you give us $5 a month, it's yours to play. And for myself, like I played Hot Lava on that. I you uh, yep. Ocean Horn uh, 2, I think is available yep. on it. You can download whatever, however many games you want. You know you're not going to get inundated with ads or having to be able to like in-app purchases or whichever. Yeah. It's just, this is the game. This is exactly what like what the developers wanted you to play. And and they and you can just, and it's kind of like a worry-free sort of thing because if you download, if you download, don't like it, you can delete it, and you don't have to worry about it because you're not paying for that specific app in and of itself. There's there's value in that, which the next topic I kind of want to get on is system-level accessibility. A lot of people use tablets, smartphones in general, because there are more extensive levels of accessibility as these are full flushed out operating system. Apple, Google, Microsoft, they all program with accessibility on the system level. Mm -hmm. And then any application, most applications are able to take advantage of those. It makes using games a lot easier on my phone mm -hmm. or tablet. I do prefer having a bigger screen like an iPad. Um, but the fact that Apple Arcade can just work with Zoom. I can zoom in if yep. I can't see text. Developer didn't really have to think about anything. Developer should be aware that those features are there and how they yep. work so they don't make any kind of um, conflicting gestures or controls. Then we move over to something like a console, right? And typically what I've seen with consoles is every new piece of hardware, they've always had their operating systems kind of rewritten from the ground up. I think PlayStation is sort of an exception where they've had that OS, which I, I'm not too familiar. Maybe you know the name of it, but that thing's kind of existed since like the PS3 slash PSP days, I feel like. Yeah, they updated it when uh, the PS4 came out, and, and there's really no name for it. There was just the PS like operating system. Cool. Um, okay. And yeah, they've added some features um, like as they went as firmware updates for accessibility. Uh, like I know that uh, Zoom was definitely a, a feature that they added in. It's not as robust as some would say, like on an Xbox console, but. PlayStation does have a de like a, a somewhat decent amount of accessibility, at least within the OS is, uh, itself. Um, the tricky part is is where developers tapping into those system settings uh, to implement them into their games is uh, not really like I don't think Sony internally. Uh, really kind of pushes that uh, as far as, or at least their first party studios to be like, hey, we've got these accessibility guidelines, uh, like take a look into it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, and there definitely is some options that are there. Like I know that at least it's not the best when it comes for like for blindness for Zoom, as it were, because there's no way to be able to control how much Zoom you have. Yeah. But for those of like, if you just want to be able to like, if there's small text, and you want to be able to like zoom in to be able to read it without having to get up off the couch to do it. It's a, it's a, it's an okay workaround, but it's not the best solution. What sure. do you look for in a game to make it accessible to you? Well, for, for like, there's generally it kind of just in accessibility in general, there's kind of four most common uh, requests that are made from disabled gamers, a full remappable controls, uh, subtitles, colorblind options, and also a, like a large readable text. That last one is the one that I focus on the most because we've seen a lot of games, even just within 2019, that did not have really large text. It kind of went on the smaller side. If you have like a stylized kind of font and that could be tough for people to be able to read. So having not only just a large font, a readable font is something that, uh, that has to be taken into effect as well. Text had only gotten smaller as games had kind of gone up in resolution. Um, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. 4K is definitely a, a major factor. In, even 720p. Uh, I yeah. just remember when Nintendo jumped from, I think the Wii had a lot of great size fonts mm -hmm. while the other two companies were like already doing 720 and 1080p. But then when Nintendo jumped the boat um, to HD finally a couple of years later, their font suddenly got small. I'm like, wait, I can't read this anymore. Yeah. Uh, yep. And it really comes down to is that like sighted people just like think, oh, it's cleaner, it's more crisp. I can make it smaller. I can fit more in the HUD and 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 uh, in the overworld. But and then, then people, there's like, you and I are like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, yeah. it's like what? Oh, it's minuscule. And then I see yeah. like even developers be like, but they've got to see the the amazing art that we've created. And I'm like, but if you can't see the art anyway, anyway, like what's the like what's the point? Where can people find you, Steve? Where can people check out and play with you? 
Uh, you can be able to check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash snowball, uh, or you can be able to follow me at, uh, at Steve Saylor on Twitter and or Instagram. Or if you want to be able to check me when I'm occasionally streaming live, you can go to mixer.com slash blind gamer Steve. These days I have other passions and, and hobbies that take up a lot of my time. So I don't get to play as many video games as I once did a few years back, but I do make sure that I touch my Nintendo Switch pretty regularly. It's, it's great, it's portable. I can take it out, though most of the time, especially as someone who has about like 5% of sight, I play it docked on a nice 27 inch 4K monitor that's just an, a mere 10 inches from my face. But luckily to my surprise, Nintendo has actually made an effort to include some accessibility within the actual operating system of the Nintendo Switch. Again, whether or not it was to try and check some technical accessibility checkboxes, or they just thought wider appeal, we have a handheld console that is HD and developers are making a lot smaller text these days, let's try to include a zoom that everyone can benefit from. Either way, it works similar to how a lot of zoom features work on other consoles or other computer technologies. So when I'm playing the Nintendo Switch and I'm seeing a lot of text on the screen, well, sometimes I just gotta be able to read what it says. So I'll zoom in, I'll use the zoom feature and it works fine, it works well. And yeah, that's pretty much, it, it does what it does. Now, if you are someone who has an ocular disorder that prefers to see things with inverted colors, well, that's an option too, which is great. And there's also grayscale. So maybe if you are colorblind or you do just don't benefit from colors whatsoever, you can turn on a grayscale and that might be easier for your eyes. That is pretty much where the accessibility kind of ends on the Nintendo Switch. Besides some individual titles, of course, either take an initiative with their own accessibility, it's for the most part pretty limited in terms of the actual hardware. One thing I will note that I do think is pretty cool is that the Joy-Cons themselves, you can actually play with them separated, so if you are someone who has limited mobility, that might be beneficial for you. I want to talk about how games can be played from a totally blind standpoint. There are times when my eyes get fully fatigued and I still might want to game or, or be able to play something, but I just I can't see without an actual like physical migraine occurring. And not only that, but it just, it, it gets worse and worse the more I strain my eyes. And this can happen within minutes. But I do want to respect that total blindness is an experience that some people are always going to experience. And Ross Miner is one of these fantastic YouTubers and gamers that very much experiences video games from a totally blind point of view since he was eight years old. So Ross and I chatted about what he looks for in a game to make it accessible. And this is what he had to say. My name is Ross and uh, I am completely blind. So I play a lot of video games. When I was younger, I used to play a lot of Pokemon before I went blind. I played like GameCube, PS2, Nintendo 64, all around that generation essentially. And after I went blind, I, I still had my passion for gaming. I still wanted to learn how to play. And so basically through memorizing all the sounds, I learned how to play Pokemon basically completely independently over the years. And so since then, I mean, so many years have gone by, I've branched out to many more different titles like Animal Crossing, Mortal Kombat, even tried a Call of Duty Zombies, play a lot of Smash Bros. Like the list of accessible games is a lot more than there used to be when I was a kid. You kind of mentioned some games that you can play right now. Mm -hmm. What is that experience like? If, if you can't see video games visually, um, what do you look for? How do you make a game accessible to someone who's totally blind? Are there some hacks that you kind of have to like work around and, and kind of perform yourself in order to do so or do a lot of these games out of the box are they accessible it completely depends on the game as well as who makes the game because honestly like some developers or companies have a reputation for being accessible or for not being accessible the general rule of thumb is that a game is not going to be accessible unless i know there's a way that i'm not moving if that makes sense so essentially well, what the first, the very first thing that made Pokemon even remotely playable is the fact that there was a bump sound whenever you hit a wall. Because mm -hmm. if there was no bump sound, I would never know that I was hitting a wall and I could just be continually running into a wall forever. It's pretty much all in the sound design. The same mechanic or concept applies to Animal Crossing. If I'm running into something, it doesn't make a bump sound, but my footstep sounds stop. So again, it's all in the sounds. Once you hear the sound stop or go, that's when that's when you know that something has changed. Same with Diablo, Mortal Kombat, Super Smash Brothers. It's the sound, and then also it's the stereo. And a lot of people don't know the difference between mono and stereo sound. So for those of you who don't know, uh, mono is when basically the sound channel is just, if you're wearing headphones, it's, if you close your eyes, it's basically right in front of you while stereo like pans around from left to right. And so when it pans from left to right, that's 
really what helps you find objects or quests in a game. So you have your footstep sounds, or bump sounds, which allow you to know where you're going, and then stereo sound, which allows you to find things. Um, and those two mechanics, I would say, are really what make gaming while blind accessible. Because if I don't have that, then yeah, there's really no point. It's kind of unfortunate because there's a lot of times where there's games that have one of those two checkboxes and don't have the other. And but they have to exist with each other at the same time. As far as menus, I mean, either you can memorize them. Or I, there are, there's technology like apps on your phone, which could, you could point the phone at the screen and read the text that way, which sounds really tedious, but that is, that's kind of what blind gamers have to do to play. Sure. Um, and then there's more expensive options like getting a capture card and using OCR, which stands for optical character recognition. And basically what it does is it takes like a screenshot of your computer screen and then extracts the text from it. And there are also some games that do have text-to-speech within the menus. I know Mortal Kombat 11 has text-to-speech, it's limited, but they do have it uh, for main menus. Skullgirls is completely screen reader accessible. I know Minecraft has a screen reader for some of the menus. I'm not sure of all of them. So it's becoming a lot more common. That's just a few. Mm -hmm. In the next few years, I feel like that's something that's really going to kind of be a, a game changer to have it, having a text-to-speech menus. If... I were to get a message out there to developers, um, the one thing, it would just be definitely TTS for the menus. That's a big one. Games just have so many customization options at this point. TTS is just, it's vital. <laughs> for an FPS, I know a big problem that a lot of blind people have is knowing where they are on the X, or sorry, the Y axis, so vertical up and down. Yeah. Um, and so just having like a simple sound to let you know when you're centered would really help out a lot. Developers from Nintendo, I often feel like tend to have more sound cues because that's just how they design their games versus like Call of Duty or just a lot of mainstream games on Xbox and PlayStation don't have as many sound cues. Mm -hmm. Nintendo, like there's like a sound cue for everything, which really helps out a lot. So if developers could just take one thing from this is just add more sounds into your game. <laughs> In order for game development studios to make their games accessible, they really can't start that process without including us. There's a great saying where it's nothing about us without us, and it's been used in both politics and uh, film industry, but I think it also extends to other industries such as the video game industry. It's very important to include a variety of accessibility consultants who are coming from all different walks of life. Even on the most recent AAA title that I've been working on, there have been multiple blind consultants in and out of that studio to help out with sharing their points of view as well. Since the start of the gaming industry, every few years there's always been a shift where new hardware from different competitors are all coming out to compete with new power and new titles to try out. At the time when this video is being filmed and made, we're towards the end of a current game generation and we're about to start up a new one later this year if not early 2021. What is great about this is we've learned so much about how games can be accessible for different kinds of audiences during this past generation. And moving forward, I do hope that studios will continue to invest in accessibility because when you invest in that, you get your return. I had the opportunity to sit down and speak with Bryce Johnson of Microsoft and Xbox. One of his biggest projects was the Xbox Adaptive Controller, which got mainstream attention during the Super Bowl. So we, we actually met back in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was at, at E3. And at the time you had been working on the Xbox adaptive controller. Yes. So that was still only in development at that time, but how have you seen the response and the impact of the adaptive controller since its release? Like what has that response been like? And, and what has that progression of new developments and updates been for, for Microsoft? Sure. Well, the response has been overwhelming. I mean, to be honest, um, but there was t literally dozens of people who, who, you know, invented the device. When we released the device that fall, um, we got a lot of really great sort of feedback because this is a first of its kind device for like someone like us. And um, so we, we got a lot of really great feedback and the excitement kind of grew, um, you know, to the point of um, when we did our Super Bowl ad that was focused on the adaptive controller. It was, it was, I will tell you, it was, a very surreal moment to like be in uh, what I did for the Super Bowl that year is I sat in a chat room with a bunch of other people basically looking at tweets and since then it's been really great to basically go around the world and talk to people about how 
what our vision for adaptive gaming is and how we think about the adaptive controller. And I will say that the adaptive controller is just sort of one tiny kind of aspect of our aspirations um, around kind of opening up things. But I think it's a very important step. It's something that, that exists. It's something that people can kind of tangibly understand and kind of wrap their heads around. I think you'll probably understand that a lot of things in accessibility tend to be a little bit hard to, to grasp for your person, mm -hmm. um, you know? So it's one of those things that I think it's, it's nice to be able to point to it and say, yeah, that. What is, I guess, Microsoft's just stance in general? Like, how do they see accessibility and gaming being incorporated into one another? Yeah, I mean, I, I think our, our story for accessibility and gaming is really just part of our story um, about accessibility in general, to be honest. We have a really strong accessibility culture that we've been working on for a very long time at Microsoft. Um, our mission at Microsoft is to empower every individual and organization on that team more. So as an accessibility team, we have to recognize that when we're not intentionally including people with disabilities um, in the products that we create, we're actively working against our mission. So it's really very important for us. And, and I don't want to make it, I don't want to make it seem like it's easy because I think the, the hardest part about accessibility development is that we always have to be vigilant about um, working with the community, you know, and making sure they're brought into everything that we do. But it's just like what you're describing, which is like as games became more realistic, um, they were pushing out um, low vision users yeah. because, you know, if you've got a gray blob in a sea of gray that's like shooting at other gray things, you know, it's, it's really tricky. So that's why it is really interesting to see games like Overwatch and Fortnite and, yeah. and a lot of these more modern games that have color, like as a, a like bright, sort of colors as an important part of their their style come out because it actually can include more people and I mean I think you know if you take that to a really far extreme we like to talk about super hot a lot you know is this game that you and everyone you're shooting at is bright red right yeah. the, the background is muted so how how is that for for vision and how does that work so that 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 art style can be really transformative um, and what we're trying to do in our practice and in our inclusive design practice is to kind of get game designers to sort of see those benefits really early on so they can make those choices as opposed to trying to ratchet them in later. I know Xbox has a built-in screen reader, uh, narrator, mm -hmm. which is really cool. How does that work specifically for Xbox? Does it have to be implemented with games individually or can it work in general? Tell me what that process is like for a developer yeah. settings window the narrator. So currently on Xbox, um, there's narrator and then there's what we have called speech services. Um, and they both have to be intentionally implemented um, by a developer. Um, the difference that I, that not to get too technical when they, when they launch their game, what happens is the core OS of Xbox, the OS that contains narrator gets put into a suspension mode. So unlike, um, unlike windows or Mac OS or anything like that, where the OS is kind of present, the core OS on Xbox basically gets put to sleep. So the core OS is kind of like a separate computer from the what's running your game, right? So narrator, um, because it's in a separate computer, it can't really even talk to the game. Narrator on. Checkbox checked. Narrator is a screen reader that reads text, buttons, and other items on your screen out loud. Narrator works best with a keyboard. So when you have a game like Gears where you have narrated menus like Gears 5, um, those developers basically roll their own screen reader. So they, they basically just call those speech APIs directly. They, they check to see if narrator's on in the host OS or they have the ability to, and then they can basically hit those APIs directly. So it isn't the most elegant screen reader solution, but it's what we kind of have to come up with to still give game developers like all the power that they want. Microsoft's app Seeing AI has been kind of praised within the blind community for being a very useful in real life screen reader, essentially, like uh, it, being able to read things off of worksheets or even off of a display just using your phone's camera. Mm -hmm. Do you see that technology and that AI kind of being implemented into other Microsoft products, such as like built into Windows or the Xbox in this case? I'm glad you brought up seeing AI. I do think there's a ton of potential for that technology to empower gamers. Um, you know, and I will say that nothing in particular that we're, uh, that we're exploring in that area at this time. Um, but at the same time, you know, what powers seeing AI is what they call Azure Cognitive Services. 
Um, so when you're going through seeing AI and you're saying, I want to read short text, I want to read currency, I want to read all this, these things. Um, the reason why they have those modes is so that we can load up basically the proper um, visualization module in, in, in Azure so that it knows what it's looking for and it knows what it can read. Um, so do I see the possibility of, of using that technology to do things like read game menus? Absolutely. And I think it'd be really powerful because as we just sort of said before, right now um, you, you've got developers who have to intentionally include um, code within their games to have them their menus spoken out. Um, and that basically excludes games from the vast catalog of back catalog games. Um, so I do think that there is a huge opportunity there. Um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get anybody's hopes up, but I think like I hear from the community, like, you know, my colleagues in Xbox, like Brandon Zahan and, and those folks would love to hear from the community about the possibility of that. What do you, I guess, even hope from even a consumer standpoint, uh, developers and publishers kind of take into consideration when it comes to accessibility and gaming going to this new generation? What do you, what advancements do you hope are going to become like just normal and, and um, normal practices? There's certainly a lot of table stakes that I think like, you know, as an industry people need to do. You know, you mentioned like, you know, when games had colorblind modes, right? Like for a long time that was like, oh, look, this game's like really accessibility progressive mode. Now it almost seems like a game is if they don't have a colorblind mode, it's like kind of ridiculous. And I hope there's a lot of other sort of standard facility things like better captions and um, things like being able to turn off screen shake and all kinds of things that the gaming accessibility community and um, you know consultants in that community kind of keep telling the industry that they need. There's definitely a lot of table stakes. I, I really look forward to a time when um, game designers basically look to the disability community as, as a source of inspiration to kind of come up with new things. I will say with our studios, they're just kind of getting started. Yeah. I think, I think you're absolutely correct in assuming that we started from a, a platform and hardware level. Um, I mean, that's, I worked on platform and hardware, right? The work that we've done is being really brought up by the studios and you've seen some really interesting things. Gaming is, um, is barriers, right? Like that's, and typically in accessibility, we talk about eliminating barriers, but when it comes to gaming, we're talking about right sizing barriers. Yeah. We're talking about customizing barriers for people because that's what a game is. A game is challenge. It was a very bold but telling move that one of the three major pillars in the gaming industry, Microsoft, was going to include accessibility from a hardware standpoint and not just a software. It's truly amazing to hear how far we've come in the last five years because frankly, five years ago, I was just embracing accessibility. You know, I, I'd known what accessibility is. I knew what I didn't have. I never had access to mobility aids and the education that I had was not accessible by any means. So when I started embracing it as an adult and learning a lot more about it, and what technologies exist out there for someone like me to obtain information and to have access to media was super important. I'm very glad to just see the progression that accessibility has made within games for the last five years. It's no longer just a colorblind mode or mappable controls. Now we're seeing text-to-speech and we're seeing full-on adaptive controllers. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm very excited to see where the next five years are going to take us with accessibility in gaming. And I hope to be a part of that discussion and continuously have these chats with game development studios and sessions where I can help consult to make these games more accessible. As for now, get involved with the discussion, get involved with the dialogue, and give feedback to developers because oftentimes they are more than willing to listen. They want to create the next best product for you, their consumer, and if you're not included with their consumer base now, let them know. I've seen it with so many different studios that are now listening and being a part of this dialogue, and not only dialogue, but this process of making their games accessible. So truly, feedback matters and it helps, and I hope that you could see different today. Leave a comment down below, let me know what your favorite video games were, what works for you, what doesn't work. Maybe you have a disability, maybe you don't. Maybe you're just not the most skilled gamer, and accessibility features are helpful for you to experience this medium. Let me know. I will hear you next time. Bye.